Hello everyone and welcome. We want to just have a time of worship this morning or afternoon or at night, wherever you're watching this broadcast. I can't tell you how excited I am to begin this year talking about this subject on divine health. And I'm so happy you've taken the time to be with us. So we want to really enter into what the Lord is doing because every season He's releasing His glory in a fresh way. And I think our understanding has increased to the level where we can be sensitive to what He's doing. And it becomes less of cliches, less of religious language, and more of an experience each time we come together as His corporate body. So that excites me, and that gives me great expectation for what's about to unfold. So right now we're just going to enter into just a time of just being still and listening to the sound of heaven through this worship time. And then I'll come back and we'll start to share what the Lord is doing. So just be still, be quiet, turn up your sound and listen to this music. of God wherever you are. Just allow Him to penetrate every cell of your being. Don't be concerned about what you need to do, what you haven't done. Just be still and know that He is God. Enter into that place of rest right now.
You know what the Lord is doing is so important because if we're sensitive to what He's doing, then we'll always be in His presence. And you know, you might have heard me speak a lot about being conscious. And I think that consciousness of what He has done, who He is, all of those things give us a new perspective of our position on this planet, the circumstances that we're going through, because there's not anything, and, and hear this, there's not anything that you can go through that He hasn't made a way for. You understand? What He did in His resurrection provided our absolute over this life. So, whatever condition you're in today, whatever circumstances you're facing, whatever situations may be coming in the future, He's already made a way for you to be victorious. And it's only when you come into that place of rest, when you understand what He's done, can you live in that peace and in that rest and in that knowledge of that. Because this is what separates us from the people that don't know Him. It's not theology. It's not the name of your church. It's not the name of your doctrines. It's your actual understanding of what He's done. If that doesn't give you the peace and the security and the understanding and victory over every situation, then you need to really get alone and recognize who He is and what He's done. No one can do that for you. We can give you tools, we can pray for you, we can do all those things, but in the end, it's your relationship with your Creator. That's the only thing that works. And I'm so glad that today, that you've taken this time to be with us and to join in as a corporate group. We are so excited for this year. We ended last year in Africa, and some of our precious people may be watching us from Zimbabwe and the surrounding areas. We send you our love and greetings. But that was one of the highlights of what we did last year, and we did a lot of things. But this year is starting off in a absolute different expectation, a higher understanding of our place and our roles and our responsibilities as His servants. And each one of you, as you have supported this ministry, as you've been part of what we're doing, we don't take it lightly. And we're so happy that you are growing in the maturity and favor of God, because that is our goal, for you to become His handiwork on this planet for you to be co-laborers with us out into the fields. And today I want to share with you what the Lord has put on my heart about divine health. Because the older we get, the more we're going to have to face this subject and these circumstances that all of us will go through because of our age and because of the physical bodies that we're walking around in. So these tabernacles, these temples of the Holy Spirit must be maintained with the spiritual understanding of what Christ has done. And part of that understanding comes from understanding our spiritual nature. I can remember when I was a child, it was just accepted that if you didn't feel good, you went to the doctor. I can remember as six years old, my mother taking me to this doctor who took my temperature, asked me why I didn't feel good, what was wrong, what were the symptoms, and those kinds of things. And immediately, before anything was out of my mouth, he already had his syringe out with the medication that he was going to inject in me. Usually it was penicillin back in those days. And it was very painful. And it, I don't know what it did, but over... The next couple of days, the symptoms started to leave. So we just assumed, okay, this guy 
is the person you go to see when you have any kind of pain. So we became, we, we, at a young age, we learned to draw that parallel between pain and a doctor. The doctor is the one you go to to get rid of your pain. So all of this at an early age became just indoctrinated inside of us as children, and it's passed on to every generation I've seen it. And the problem is those kinds of medications, those kinds of antibiotics don't do anything to give you health. They remove the symptoms, but over time they start to create an imbalance inside of your body. They start to disrupt the natural flow that God had set up for every human being to live in perfect health. And we've come to understand that some of the pains and discomforts we're feeling is part of the body detoxing itself. So when you add chemistry to a natural process that God has already put inside of us to clean us, then it really starts to contaminate and corrupt the natural cell development inside of our bodies. We start to have disruptive connections between the organs in our body. And those chemicals that are inside of our body start to break down other organs. So it's very important for us to take a step back when we're feeling any kind of discomfort. And don't automatically connect your discomfort with something that is wrong and needs to be fixed by someone else. See, that's where our trust has to really come under scrutiny. Do we trust God with everything of who we are, of what we're created to be? And if we do, then we can trust Him with our bodies. Now, He will give us right directions when it comes to what we put in our bodies. And I've seen over time that the wrong foods have created the wrong choices. In fact, I wrote this book called Quantum Fasting, that gives you a little bit of understanding and some tools on some of the things that you need to put in your body, some of the things you don't need to put in your body. Because the connection with your thoughts and your blood are a dynamic interaction with the choices you make. You see, your blood is your life flow. It is what keeps your body alive. And when that blood is contaminated, then it affects all parts of your body. And not anything from the outside can fix that. That has to be fixed from the inside because the blood didn't come from the outside. It came from heaven. It's part of the spiritual DNA of who you are. That's why it's so important, really important to understand the blood. And that's why Jesus had to shed his blood. So that's a different message altogether, but it is something that you need to really dig into. And that's why the, the communion is so important. That's why you eat his body and you drink his blood. And you do that symbolically, but spiritually it plays the most important dynamic role inside of your being that, um, that will absolutely change your physical condition. So, if you haven't read Anna's book, Eat My Flesh and Drink My Blood, I highly recommend it. It will give you a spiritual understanding as well as a practical understanding of why you take communion. And it's a very, very important process of changing your spiritual and your physical being. So today, let's look at a few scriptures that talk about physicians, that talk about um, how Jesus interacted with that dynamic. So let's look in Matthew, the ninth chapter. Let's read this verse. We've probably all read it or heard it several times. It's Matthew 9, 12. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So we know there were sick people in Jesus' time. And we know that the physicians of that time did not rely on the same kinds of chemistry and uh, synthetic drugs, pharmaceuticals, and things of that nature. 
In fact, in let's look at Luke 4. And you remember Luke was a physician. Luke 4. Verse 23, he said to them, you will surely say this proverb, this is Jesus speaking to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. So Jesus is talking about a physical healing here. He's talking about in Capernaum where he did all of these miracles, where people's blind eyes were open where uh, demons were cast out of people. So Jesus is using a physical metaphor to talk about a spiritual condition, which is really interesting to understand. Because the physician was, is designed, I believe, to keep the physical body naturally functioning. Not synthetically, not pharmaceutical-wise, but natural. You'll see that there was a, uh, uh, in one of the scriptures in Proverbs in another book, not the ones that we find in our book, but in other uh, books that are not in this Bible, talks about how Luke used a willow tree when he observed the, the willow tree and the uh, bark and the leaves to take care of fevers and discomfort. And if you look at the pharmaceuticals of bare aspirin, it comes from the willow tree. It's the exact same chemistry that they synthetically reproduce in aspirins from the willow bark. So the natural things in the earth, which was designed to take care of man's condition, have been used by the pharmaceutical country, companies to reproduce their synthetic drugs. So physicians during the time of Jesus understood how things in nature operated to keep the physical body in a physical homeostasis or balance with nature. Because your physical body works in harmony with all of God's creation. You see, when you're in harmony with what God's created, you really don't have any enemies. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds very strange, but there are lots of books and stories of people who had animals that rescued them, who had situations where they were not doing well and the animals in the forest took them to safety or kept them fed. There's all kinds of stories like that. So when your body is operating in the harmony with nature, with God's creation, Everything in nature knows what's in harmony, what's breathing the, the air of God and the frequency and vibrations of heaven. There's no threat. There's no, there's no confrontation. There's no enemies. That's the way God designed this planet, to work in harmony with everything. So if you're out of balance then your body is going to be out of balance. You're going to have fear. You're going to have all this anxiety. There's going to be all of this stuff that your body emits that nature knows is not in harmony and does not want to be infected by that mentality or that disease. So you are this antenna that's either producing life or it's a frequency of fear, doubt, unbelief, all of the things that oppose what God has created in nature. So we see in the scriptures how Luke talks about, um, yeah, let's look at this. Let's look at Luke 8, 43. <clears throat> this is a good scripture. In verse, we'll begin in verse 42. Now, let's, let's start in verse 40. 
This is Luke 8, verse 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged around him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garments, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? You see, Jesus is demonstrating in this parable that we all know that the real connection between your life and your health is in your blood flow. And physicians don't have the solution for anything that's wrong with your blood. That takes a divine intervention. Listen to me. And you will, if you go down to the root, you dig down to the problems of physical ailments in people's body, you'll discover that it's connected with the blood in some way. And your blood has been dynamically and divinely given to each human being by your Creator. The DNA in your blood, the way it's constructed, the cells, all of that comes from your Heavenly Father. And when you corrupt that blood through wrong thinking, through wrong eating, through anything that happens to interrupt that divine connection between you and your Heavenly Father, it's going to produce an imbalance. It's going to produce symptoms. It's going to make you not feel right. And we have become so sensitive to what feels wrong that we miss out on what feels right. Did you hear me? We trained ourselves from an early age to be so sensitive to what doesn't feel right that we miss out nine-tenths of our day on what feels right. So what the Lord is trying to get us to understand here today is that if we start becoming conscious of all the goodness that He's doing, all the right things that He's putting that He's protecting us from or keeping us surrounded with, we'll become less sensitive to what's not in balance and more sensitive to what He's doing to keep us close to Him. And that begins with your blood. So when this lady touched the hem of the garment of Jesus, she was healed instantly. Why? Because she believed that this man was carrying something that the physicians didn't have any understanding of. That this man came from God. <laughs> that this man was carrying something she trusted Jesus. So the minute we stop trusting what Jesus has done is a path that will lead us further and further away from our divine destiny, from the balance that He's created us to live in, all of the things that come instantly when you touch the hem of His garment. And that to me is a metaphor for coming into the presence of God, coming into the presence of Christ, understanding what He's done for us. And that instantaneous healing may have to be worked out in your consciousness, in your body. But when He touches you, you're whole instantly. But you see, because of all the images that we've created for illness and sickness and disease, we have to go through all of those pictures, all of those experiences to deactivate them, to delete them from a computer imagery that we formed inside of us. Because of all the things that happen, we connect the dots 
to those experiences and says, okay, that reminds me of, that connects me back to those days when I felt this and it always led to this sore throat or this runny nose or this kind of condition. You see, we, we really have to delete all that junk that we've stored up as our reality because that's not our reality. That's not who you were created to be. You are created to live in divine health. And it's the same way with salvation. You don't come to Jesus saved, right? You come to Him so that that salvation process can start to change your condition. And it's the same way with your divine health. You don't get divine health immediately in your physical body until that process that you have to go through in that salvation starts to change you. You have to get rid of the other stuff. You have to delete that stuff. You can't be attached to it. The minute you start to attach feelings with some experience in the past, you're not conscious of what He's done for you. If you stay conscious of what He's doing for you, you'll start breaking the connections of what you felt when you weren't conscious of what He's doing to you. So, everything is our responsibility, isn't it? Everything depends on us. And the minute you start putting your trust in someone else to make you feel right, to make you lose those symptoms, is the minute you lose that ability to stay conscious of what He's already done for you. And I think that's a very important understanding that we need to really, really practice every day. Because it's very easy to be sidetracked and distracted. That's what this whole planet does. It distracts you because the same way we have this cause and effect is the same way we start drawing wrong conclusions. And that's what the early physicians did. You know, they were all trained in Greece. And in Greece, the physicians were trained to tell the people, listen, you're sick because the gods are punishing you. Did you know that? That's what the early Greek physicians were trained to believe. It's the gods that are punishing you. Now, Hippocrates, Hippocrates uh, that's the oath that the physicians take. He started breaking away from those traditions of the Greeks. And he started to explain to the people, you're in this condition because of wrong living, wrong eating, wrong behavior. So he became one of the first people to start talking about cause and effect in the medical industry. That's why all of these pharmaceutical drugs, that's why everyone in the phys medical industry says, okay, you're this way, you need this drug to fix that. Not the gods punishing you per se, but the drugs become the gods. Right? That's why it was called pharmaceuticals. So they took it out of the, the fairy tale attitude of the gods punishing you and put it in the hands of the pharmaceutical industry, saying, These, this is your solution. So that's how it moved from the Greek gods punishing you into the pharmaceutical industry through that whole cause and effect mentality. It's not cause and effect when you enter into the kingdom of God. There is no longer cause and effect. If there was, Jesus wouldn't say, look at the birds. They don't sow or reap, and the heavenly Father takes care of them. You see the difference? The kingdom of God is like the birds. Your Father knows what you need, and He takes care of you. So you don't have to sow to reap what your heavenly Father does. And that's the mentality of most Christians. I've got to do this in order to get the favor of my Father. No. You have to be conscious of what He's done so that you can already see what you have. <laughs> You're not missing anything except the presence of God in your daily life. And when we're conscious of that, all of these things that we're striving for, that's what Jesus says, all the things you're striving for, your Heavenly Father has already given you when you enter the kingdom. Entering the kingdom is the same thing as being in the presence of Christ because He is the kingdom. Now, 
So we see now that one of the things that we have entered into is contaminating our temple through wrong eating. And this book talks about fasting. And I think fasting is one of the, for me, it was the most important exercise I could do to feed my spirit and starve my flesh. And it's very interesting to understand where the word fasting comes from. How many of you know where the word fasting comes from? It's a German word. It actually comes from the, the Old Norse fasta, which means to hold firmly. So back in those days, they used that term fasta, the Germans, to hold fast. And then it became evolved over time to control oneself. So later it became used in fasting, control your appetite. So fasting is controlling your urges and your desires to eat. So it's very interesting to see how that term fasting has evolved over time. And one of the things that I've learned is that our well-being physically depends on our spiritual nature. And that's one of the reasons I believe fasting helps you get in contact with your spiritual nature. The more physical material you do without, whether it be your social media with your phones, whether it be your physical foods, all of the social contacts you have, the more you do without that for a period of time, the more in contact you come with your spirit, the more sensitive you become to your spirit. And the more you start to understand the authority God's given you through your spirit, that is who you are. But most of us think we're who we see in the mirror or how we feel or what other people say about us or what you read on your Facebook page. That's who you think you are. But that's not who you are. That's why Jesus says in John 6, 63, one of my favorite scriptures in all of the Bible. Look at it. John 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Now, if Jesus is saying it is the Spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing, then we have to understand that all of the things that we're doing for this physical body is not what's producing life. What's producing life is the words that we heard and we hear and we understand from the one who is life. Jesus said, I came to bring you life, right? And Jesus is the life and the light of all men. Look in John 1. See, the, the spiritual connection is un, undeniable, and we have to really stay focused with that. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, Jesus is the Word, and He's speaking the Word. Look at that. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So everything that was, has physical being came from the Word, right? In Him, in Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, we're talking about, now look at the, how he uses this word. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, he's using past tense. John is talking in past tense here. He says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is before the foundation of the world. So everything you're living today, you have already lived in the spiritual realm.
Because in the spiritual realm, there's no time. Time doesn't exist. So the real you is living in that timeless place now. So when John is talking about in him was life, you've already lived your life as his light because that's where you're from. That life is in him. That light is in him. So if you're walking in darkness, if you're living in darkness, if you're surrounded by darkness, it's because the light that was in you, you chose to walk away from. Because that's part of our, our choice. We, we have that choice. So when Jesus says, the words that I speak are life, he's trying to reconnect you. Listen now. He's reconnecting you to your spirit that was made by him. Your spirit was made by him. All things were made by him. If he reconnects your spirit, you're connected to his light. Then you don't walk in darkness anymore. Then your choices are not made from the physical realm that have no life. You see, when people make choices from this dimension, Jesus says that's the dimension that has no life. The life comes from the dimension of your spirit. Now, I want that to be really, I want that to sink in. Because you're not going to fix anything that's wrong with you from this dimension. It has to be from the dimension from where you were created. Because where you were created, you were created perfect. There was nothing wrong with you because that's what Jesus says in John. In him was, that's what John says, in him was life and his life was the light of all men. So he's saying we're separated from that life when we come to this physical planet. So if you want that life, you must reconnect your spirit to the life giver. Now that takes a conscious decision on every human being's part. That's why he uses past tense. That's why salvation is a spiritual reconnection, the new birth with your original design. When you start focusing on that, when you start concentrating on that, things are going to start shifting in your life. You're going to start breaking those connections of images of the past that have kept you locked into pain, suffering, doubt, unbelief. Because now you're going to start focusing on who you were from the beginning. Right? You see this, this verse in Ephesians? Look, look, Ephesians. Paul knew it. He, he got a revelation of it. Ephesians 1, <clears throat> verse 3 and 4. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, in Christ, just as He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. You see, in that condition that Paul is describing here, that's where holiness is. That's where there's no blame. That's who you are. That's who your spirit is. All of the physical things you're going through, all of the pain and suffering, all of the things that are happening to distract you from that revelation, that knowledge is keeping you from the treasures you were designed to leave for the next generation. 
you're not here just to be here. <laughs> you're here to leave treasures for the future generations to grow in a greater revelation of Christ. That, that's the amazing thing about Christ. He never stops ascending in revealing who He was before the foundation of the world. The minute you put Him in a box, the minute you think you have Him figured out, is the minute you have left eternity. You're no longer a spirit. Now you've brought Him down to the dimension of this physical dimension where he's Jesus of Nazareth and suffers on a cross and he's got to come back and save me. His resurrection gave you the keys over all of the circumstances of this planet, of this dimension. That's what he said. He said there's going to be tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome it. You know what overcome means? You don't have to go through it. You can. Tribulations are going to come and you can get involved in them. You can wrap your mind in them. You can go through them. You can say, poor me. I'm so, I'm a victim. All of the things that your mind gives you those <sighs> reasons or justifications to attach on to, you can go there. And you can wallow in it. You ever seen a, a pig in wallowing in mud? You ever seen how they root around? It can be a dry land. But you put a pig in a pen and let him root around and roll around, and pretty soon it'll be wet. Because he'll keep digging. He'll keep moving the earth around. He'll keep wallowing is the word. They wallow in this pit, and it becomes a big mud puddle. And then it's what the Bible calls miry clay. And you get stuck in it because you chose to see yourself surrounded by a pin thrown in there with no way out. That's what circumstances do to you. That's what your justification for feeling sorry for yourself will do to you. You have the keys. You're the overcomer. And you've been designed to overcome. But if you want to wallow in the miry clay and say, poor old me, why is this happening to me? It, I don't deserve it. Did Jesus deserve it? No. But he chose to go through it so that we wouldn't have to. So every time we choose to go through and stay in a situation instead of going through it, then we're saying, what Jesus did is not good enough for me. But it is good enough. And it's more than good enough. So all of these conditions that you find yourself in, you got to recognize that they were already taken care of. And it's got to be more than just a cliche. It can't be just Bible language. You have to know that. You have to go through it. Because going through these experiences is what gives you the confidence to be the overcomer of all the distractions that you will go through while you're on this planet. Okay. So we know that we're a spirit being. We know that we were created before the foundation perfect. And that reconnection gives us the ability not to be distracted by the symptoms or the circumstances that we may be going through. Okay, we've been talking about that. All right. All right. Let's look at Zechariah 12.1. Zechariah. Where are you, Zechariah? Zechariah, okay. 12.1. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel says, who stretched, okay. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. 
This was the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Now get a picture of this. This is the Lord God, who stretches out the heaven, lays the foundation of the earth. Okay, he makes this big stage that we live on physically, and forms the spirit of man within him. So get this picture. Here is God stretching out all of the physical realms of the space, time, all of that. He stretches it out. He forms the earth. He builds the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. So he takes heaven. He takes this inexhaustible creative space that's beyond time, beyond dimension, and puts it inside this physical being and puts it in this physical dimension. Look at the picture. This spirit that is in you is timeless, it's eternal, it's creative, it's connected to the Creator, it's inside this physical being placed inside this physical dimension. So the physical dimension is going to be interacting in a finite realm with an infinite being. You're an infinite being with all the secrets, all the ability to touch your Creator inside this finite space so that you can create everything you believe on this planet. That is the immortality God has put inside of you. And when you reconnect that back to your Creator, all of the knowledge, all of the power, all of the authority over this creative space is at your disposal. Meaning, you're not in this box that you see. You're outside this box connected to your Heavenly Father, and you are part of those witnesses above time and space, rooting yourself on. If you see yourself as a finite being surrounded by the circumstances without any way to escape, then you don't see the picture that he is, describes here in Zechariah. Because that's what makes your spirit that much more powerful and that knowledge makes you that much more an overcomer than the average bear walking the planet. So you have to see that. Now, so our life is connected by the Spirit. Let's go to John 6. Our real life is connected by the Spirit. All right, so verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 51. This is Jesus speaking. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So Jesus is using the metaphor of eating his flesh, drinking his blood as the communion to have life in him. For, the fle for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. So this goes back to what we spoke about with the communion. This goes back to Jesus being the manna in the wilderness for the children of Israel. This goes back to the bread of life, right? Now, as we see in verse 53, there is no life in us until we reconnect with our spirit. I keep hammering on that because I want you to see 
your spiritual nature. I want you to get a hold of this. I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. But if you are just distracted by the physical realm and the circumstances of the physical realm, you'll stay disconnected from your spirit, where the real authority is, where your real life is. And you have to keep reminding yourself every time your mind wants to go back and justify your condition or your symptoms with something that's happened in the past, you lose your connection with the present and the present is where the spirit of the living God is. Okay? Okay. In we see that, all right, I mentioned fasting. I want, I want to take you to what Jesus did in Luke 4. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, he was filled with the Spirit after he was baptized by John. And then he was filled with the Spirit. We saw the dove. Jesus, I mean, John describes seeing the dove land on Jesus after he came out of the water. We have all read that. So he was filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit led him into the wilderness. So, obviously, if you receive the Spirit of God, you're going to be tested to understand exactly what that means. Are you an overcomer? If you're receiving your connection back to the Spirit of God, you're going to absolutely be tested. Absolutely. There's no two ways about it. So, he returns filled with the Spirit, and being tempted for 40 days by the devil... And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when they ended, he was hungry. So here the devil comes to him after 40 days, not during the 40 days, after the 40 days. And if you read the rest of these scriptures, you're going to see that Jesus overcame the devil on what? An empty stomach. So it's not about you being full of the food from this dimension as a warrior or anything else to overcome the devil. Jesus defeated the devil face to face on an empty stomach. So he's showing us something here, isn't he? He's saying it's not the substances of this planet that's going to give you authority over the spiritual nature. It's about your relationship with the Spirit of God that makes the devil leave you. All right? So I believe the devil is, was defeated after Jesus was resurrected. And I believe that right now, what we go through is the design of heaven to overcome and remove all of those images that we've passed down through our bloodline of our condition before the fall or after the fall. After the fall... Man is born into this condition where his mindset is this nature that we're in, this physical arena that we have to fight in, is the reality of who we are. It's not the reality of who you are. But if you believe that, then the, you're going to create these mindsets. You're going to create these stumbling blocks. You're going to have all these reasons why you do what you do and why you are going through what you're going through. Jesus is showing us it's not this physical realm that has the authority over the spiritual realm. It's that recognition of who your father is. Because every time Jesus was confronted with a temptation, he quoted what he was hearing his father say. He knew what his condition was spiritually. And if you know what your condition is spiritually, what you're coming against naturally has no substance. You give it substance. You give it life 
through what you believe. And if you take that life away because you don't believe that that authority is over you, that situation, that circumstances has that authority over you, then it becomes ineffective to you. It's, it's ineffective to you. So Jesus goes through these temptations on an empty stomach, and we see that that power that he displayed was visible on him. He was recognizable as someone who was not from this planet. <laughs> That's why the, 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 the religious people didn't like him because he was carrying an authority and a power that was greater than what they were serving. They were serving an image. They were serving a, uh, something from the past. He was bringing them the revelation that was coming of the new covenant. But they were just focused on the past. And if you're focused on the past, you're going to live under that cause and effect religion not on what he's done and not what he's doing daily in your life. Because he's doing something individually with every one of us, every day. That's the interaction. That's the connection we have with the life of God. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 and 3. Now, I want, I want these scriptures, I, I hope you're writing them down so that you can study them. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but, by, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So in Deuteronomy, Moses is talking about what Jesus was displaying in the wilderness because one of the temptations the devil was, was giving Jesus was says, turn these stones into bread because the devil knew that Jesus was the manna. The devil knew that he was the son of God, but he knew that he was hungry as well. So what Moses is connecting with what Jesus went through in the temptation in the wilderness is this hunger and this desire. So hunger is not just associated with bread, but hunger is associated with all of our appetites. And this is what fasting brings to the surface inside of us we start to recognize what our appetites are. Some people, it's not just food, it's entertainment, it's the desire to stay busy, it's an appetite not to be still, it's to be moving, it's an appetite for consumption of all things. So appetite means consuming. Now we are created to be consumers physically. We have to consume water. We have to consume air. We need to have sleep. All of these things we're designed to consume. But when you start fasting the most basic of those things, such as food and water, you start to recognize the voices that your physical body have <laughs> and your mind. So the, I can remember the first time I started fasting. I was thinking more about what I was fasting than if I was eating. I could not get away from thinking about, oh, I can't wait till I eat. I can't. I started planning that meal. I started tasting it inside of me, all of those things. So your body has associated hunger and consumption with all of these things that satisfy us or so that we think are satisfying. So fasting starts to disconnect you from what you were satisfied by. And then you start to recognize there's not anything in the physical plane that is more satisfying than the presence of God. It satisfies you. It fills every part of your spirit, soul, and body with who created you. So that's why fasting is such an important tool. 
you start to identify those things inside of you that are driving you, that are consuming you, that are making you think about things that are taking you away from being present with God. Because that's where the authority is. That's where the power is. That's where your spirit reconnects with your Creator. That's where your rest is. Okay. Let's look at one of the early designs of fasting in Daniel. Look in Daniel chapter 1. I want to show you something here. Begin with chapter 1, and let's just read beginning in verse... The king instructed Asphana, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had abilities to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Now the Chaldeans were the Babylonians. It's interesting to understand God was the one that had Israel overthrown and taken captive by Babylon. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, the king himself drank, and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So the king had this program in place where he would choose the best candidates from places that they um, dominated or over, overthrew, and he would take the next generation and train them in their language, in their customs, so that they could serve before the king and understand their position. This is, this is important. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies. Now, in verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he should not, would not defile himself with the portions of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which the king drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs, eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, why was the wine also connected with what Daniel abstained from? Now, wine is created as a spiritual drink in many places. It connects you with the culture. It connects you with the attitudes and thoughts of the people. Wine comes from the indigenous regions in most places, where in this particular area, and it was before the king. The king was drinking this wine. And for a reason, Daniel said, I don't want to not only eat the food, but I don't even want to drink the wine from the table of the king. So he was making a decision that everything from the Chaldeans would defile his temple that he grew up in this Jewish understanding. They had a very strict regimen of what they ate. And Daniel was a very wise man. And he was also very strong in his commitment. So he says, this is what I want you to, to give me. He said, So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over him, Please, please test your servants for ten days, and let, the, let them give us, it's not vegetables, in the, in the uh, original language, it's pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, this is what we don't understand because we've probably heard different fastings. I'm going to have a Daniel fast. Well, Daniel asked for pulse and water to drink. And if you study what pulse is, you'll see that it's the seed, it's the germ of the grain. In other words, you've had, alpha, you've had 
uh, alfal alfalfa sprouts perhaps, or bean sprouts, or things of that nature. The germ that's inside the bean, or the germ that's inside the grain, is the life of that seed. So Daniel was asking for the life of the seed and pure water to drink for 10 days. And he said that he would be much better off than if he was drinking the wine or eating the meat from the king's table. And he understood that that was part of the detoxification process that his body needed to go through. He understood that he was taken captive. And many of us have been taken captive by our appetites. Many of us have been taken captive by pharmaceutical drugs. Many of us are taken captive by the thoughts in our, in our condition of imprisoning ourselves through our mental condition. And Daniel understood the physical body needs to be detoxed in order to receive the spiritual enlightenment that we're designed to be antennas for. As an antenna, we can receive from the realm that we're connected to. And if our appetites keep us connected to this dimension, through wrong eating, through wrong believing, wrong thoughts and wrong entertainment, whatever, it disconnects us from the spiritual realm. It disconnects us from receiving from what the Spirit say. And it only took 10 days. Now, you're going to discover that 10 is a very, very important number. It's, it's the number God used for balance, for perfection in the physical body. You count how many fingers you have. You count how many toes you have. You look at all the ways 10 has been used throughout the scriptures. Let, let me just give you a couple of ideas here for you to study. 10 is a very important number in the scriptures. Remember back in 2 Kings, Daniel, I mean, the, the king had the sun move back 10 degrees so that he could live, um, so that he could stop. It was, it was um, Joshua. Joshua was fighting the battle, and it was moved back 10 degrees because he needed more daylight. And then the creation is wind, water, fire, and earth, four, and man is six. So the number of creation is 10, and the number of man with creation and man. There was 10 commandments. In the temple, there was 10 lampstands and 10 bowls. In Genesis 1, if you count how many times God said, it was 10 times. The Passover lamb was selected the 10th day of the first month. The tenth day of the seventh month was atonement. There was ten horns in Revelation, ten generations that lived before the flood. The Holy Spirit fell ten days after the ascension. Jesus used the ten lepers as a design of how many would come back. Only one came back. Ten plagues in Egypt. Jesus told the parables with ten virgins, ten coins, ten minas. So, all through the scriptures, we see this number ten as being one of the ways of like three and seven. Three and seven is also a number of, cre of perfection. God used the number of ten. It was ten commandments, right? So, all of these Tens are very, very significant when it comes to the physical nature of man. That's the balance. That's the design that God shows that will put us in a organized, in a position of balance. Ten toes, ten, ten fingers. The balance that our body needs to be cleansed. Daniel didn't just pop out with 10. That was a design from the Spirit of God. You want to detox yourself? You want to be clean before God? I recommend that you do water and live seeds, sprouts, something alive for 10 days and see what that does for your physical being. 
just do water and start detoxing yourself and just use the number 10 as a way that God has set it and originated it before the foundation of the world to get your body in balance. Because I think you're going to start to experience something different if you'll do that. I know I didn't start that way. I started with 21 days and I did the water and I did all of these other things. But as I started researching this, I started to see the, the, the design of God. And I started to see that this is a, a, a very, very important step that Daniel took. And I believe it would be an important step for you to begin your year. Now, I have a lot more I want to say, but we'll do that at another time. I just believe that if you've taken the time to be here and you take the time to study this material, you're, the Lord is going to give you revelation and understanding that you didn't have before. And it will help you understand your spirit. Help you understand your desires are, can be controlled by the Spirit of God. Your appetites can be controlled by the Spirit of God. And that your frustration and anxiety and discontent is just part of the distraction process from the mind that has not been conditioned to recognize the Spirit of God. Because before the foundation of the world, you were connected with your Heavenly Father. You were spiritually connected. And that's who you are. That is your life. And all of this stuff that has been going on around you or has distracted you, you can come in alignment. And I believe this is a word for you today. Get along with the Spirit of God for 10 days. Detox your body from the appetites that have corrupted the way you think and the way you believe. And let the Spirit of God speak to you. And then I want to hear from you. I want to know how you're doing, what's going on in your life. We're here for you. Now, I think that as we begin this next year, there's going to be so many things that are going to have an opportunity to change your life. And if you support this ministry, and if you will stay connected with what we're doing, and use this as an avenue for your growth and for you to expand in what you already know, <laughs> then we can move at a greater dimension in Christ. And we can leave treasures behind for the next generation. But we want to hear from you. We, we really desire the support and, 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 um, and testimonies that we're getting from all of the people around the planet, the people that are watching Frequencies of Glory TV, you're amazing. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. So many of you are, are just giving over and above what you started in giving, and it just blesses our hearts. And we know the Lord is going to bless you. We know He's already blessed you. And Father, I prophesy right now that this year will be the best year of every person that's viewing this video's life. That there will no longer be a victim. That they'll recognize the keys over death and hell have been given to them. And they are no longer going to be under the circumstances and under the weight of pain and suffering and distress. That you will show them how to enter into your rest. That you will teach them your ways. And I ask you, Lord, that every person under the sound of this voice will receive a hundredfold for giving and supporting this ministry, Lord. I want you to show yourself as the God of all supply to everyone who trusts you with their resources. In Jesus' name. Oh, and I left out one important thing about 10. 10 is the number of the tithe. So... Until I see you next time, I want to bless you. I want to tell you that we are thrilled that you are part of what we're doing here. And we are going to be coming up with new and better ways to reach you and to interact with you in the coming weeks. So stay tuned to what our uh, website is saying and doing. We love you. We bless you. And we'll see you next time. God bless you.